I want to read to you God's word concerning what we just heard. I'm going to read from the Gospel of Mark, beginning with verse number 9 in chapter 1. Here's how Mark explains it. It says, At that time Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert and he was in the desert 40 days being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading and hearing of his holy word. It's all about him. Is that what John said? It was all about him. Still is, he would say. This voice. Funny how when you think about John, and we heard John this morning. Sort of. We heard John. And uh, heard his voice. It's interesting to think about how the voice played such a significant role in the life of John the Baptist, right? I mean, think about it for a minute. Even before he was born, at the announcement of his birth, his father Zechariah, when the angel Gabriel came to him and said that Elizabeth would have a baby, he didn't quite believe, and he lost his voice. And when Mary came to visit her cousin Elizabeth, when John, who was still inside the womb of his mother, heard the voice of Mary, he leapt for joy. And now we hear that he is a voice in the wilderness as proclaimed through Scripture that he would be. And then we see a baptism take place. And in that baptism, when Jesus comes out of the water, we hear the voice of God. Voice plays a pretty significant role in the life of John the Baptist as frankly it does in our lives as well. Voice is always significant. He was prophetically the voice in the wilderness. The prophet Isaiah, 700 years before he was born, said that he would be the voice calling out in the wilderness. But yet it caused me to contemplate, if only for a few moments, you know what? No matter where we physically live. No matter what our address is, we really live in the wilderness, don't we? I mean, think about it for a minute. We are living in the wilderness, in, in, in spiritual darkness, in times where, 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 where things are troubling. You, you, don't, you don't necessarily believe that. Just turn on the evening news. You don't think we're living in the wilderness? Turn on the evening news. Or, or try to go see a movie. Interestingly enough, this week, I, 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 Denise and I were sitting uh, alone one evening this week, and, and I get this text from Redbox. Anybody you know what Redbox is? It's a movie rental, Redbox. And they sent me this text that says, you can have a free movie rental tonight. And so I'm all excited, because anytime I see the word free, I get all excited. Free, free. I spent the next 20 minutes looking at every movie available, and then said, I can't find a single movie that's, that's worth free. So I handed the phone to my wife and said, I just can't find anything. You see, we're living in dark times. We're living in the wilderness. You don't think so? Just turn on your TV set. Just, just get on the internet. You know, or try, as one of our members did, try, try putting a message on Facebook that proclaims God's word and is somewhat convicting, and see how people respond. We're living in darkness. We're living in the wilderness. And, you know, while we are not prophetically the voice of one calling in the wilderness, 
I believe that God is calling us to be a voice in the wilderness. I believe he's calling us right now to be that voice that, 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 that reaches out because you see, in the wilderness, there are a lot of people out there who do not know Jesus. There are a lot of people who never heard his name before, or never trusted him, never asked him to come into their life. And so we are being called, I believe, we are being called to be that voice in the wilderness. But here's the thing. The only one way that happens if we make it all about him. Has to be all about him. As John proclaimed this morning. That's at the heart of the message God gives us and lays on our hearts and our calling. It's about Him, not about us. Let's pray for a moment. God, as we reflect upon uh, Your Word this morning, I pray that You would uh, touch our hearts in such a way that we would, we would hear, hear in a new way, that we would understand in ways maybe we never have before, and through the power of Your Holy Spirit, Lord, we would be able to apply Your Word to our lives. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. John proclaims that word. That burden had been lifted off of him because suddenly he realized it wasn't about him. And I think that's an important aspect we need to, to understand. You look at John's life, and as this drama unfolds, John is, is in a cell. He is at the end of his ministry, nearing the end of his life. He will be put to death because of, because of his stand for Jesus Christ. And he's stuck, if you will, in a cell. And I think that you and I can relate to that to some degree because sometimes we feel stuck, don't we? You ever feel stuck? I know you're not stuck in a cell, but you feel just kind of walled in sometimes. You ever feel that way? Maybe stuck in a job, stuck in a relationship, stuck in a financial crisis, whatever the case might be. Sometimes we, we feel stuck. And in the end, the answer remains the same, isn't it? It's all about him. We want to get unstuck. It's about him. And John proclaims this story that brings that all into focus for him. He, he, it's interesting. He would go back to this single episode in our drama this morning. The episode of just being there baptizing. People coming up to him, preaching this message of repentance. And suddenly, off in a distance, he sees his cousin, Jesus. Coming to him. Behold the Lamb of God, he says. Behold the Lamb of God. And, 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 and it takes a little bit of convincing, but John, John agrees finally to baptize Jesus. He agrees to baptize him. And, and, and one of the questions that always comes up, doesn't it, is why, why did Jesus need baptized anyways? This is the blameless, this is the spotless, this is the sinless Lamb of God. Why, why did he even want to be baptized? And I guess I don't want to get into a long spiritual discussion or theological debate here this morning. There's a lot of reasons why it is proclaimed that he was baptized. One of the things that, that many scholars believe is he wanted to more closely identify himself with the people that he came to save. He wanted to identify himself with the people that he came to save. He, he, he at some level, uh, many believe, wanted to set an example and this falls under the Baptist theology. He wanted to set an example of baptism that we would follow as we go forward. And so you have that idea as well that's taught and proclaimed under the theology of baptism. There's also the idea that it is a foreshadowing of what is to come. It is pointing towards the cross, if you will. You know, I, I believe Paul in 2 Corinthians... I think it's maybe in chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians, he says something to the degree that he, namely God, made him, namely Jesus, sin, who knew no sin. Although he knew no sin, he made him sin, is what Paul is saying. Why? So that we might be made righteous. We might be the righteousness of God. And, and, and so there is this foreshadowing that Jesus would take upon himself all of our sin as, as he is baptized. Uh, in the Jordan on that day. There's a lot of reasons why people will debate and discuss why Jesus was baptized, even though he was sinless. Uh, as to the exact purpose, I can't say for sure, but there was determination, clearly, uh, in Jesus as he uh, was doing, do, willing to do whatever he could do to make sure that we would be set free, that we would no longer be stuck, whatever our place is in life. And really, Baptism is the starting point of that, isn't it? 
Baptism is the starting point. That, that's where, 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 where we are freed. We are freed from our sin. Now, I don't want to imply, it is certainly a Baptist uh, theology, that, that when we go in a baptistry, that our sins are washed away, that we are made unstuck from our sins. Um, because that act of baptism is an outward sign of something that has taken place inward. It is representative of the cleansing and the forgiveness of our sins that took place that moment we asked Jesus into our lives. And at that moment, we were baptized. We were baptized by the Holy Spirit. And so, so our sins are washed away. And so it represents that. That's what we believe as Baptists. Um, we, we, we see it as significant in that regard. And, and so we, we see this, this idea of this symbolic cleansing and this profession of faith that we want to make when we are baptized. We see that we are indeed following the example of Jesus Christ. As we've already heard this morning in Mark chapter 1, Jesus has set an example for us to follow. We see and believe as Baptists that we are also following the command of Jesus. What did Jesus say? What did he say in Matthew 28 before? It was almost the last thing he said before he was taken up to be at his Father's side. He said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He commands us to baptize. And so we follow these, these examples, these commands. We follow the example of the New Testament church. Because we look at God's word and we see example after example of how when somebody heard the good news about Jesus Christ, they heard it and then they believed it and then what did they do? They were baptized. And so we have all of these reasons because, because God gives us this to reflect upon. And I believe God calls us to go ahead and be baptized. I believe it's a big part of, of the freeing experience we have of becoming unstuck from our past lives, from, from the sin that kept us separated from God. It, it, we, we are, we're no longer stuck. And on top of all of that, we know that it's pleasing to God. When we are baptized, I believe much as God said, said from the, from the, I'm not saying the skies open up, mind you. When we do a baptism here, I'm not saying the skies open up and, and God says, this is my child in whom I love and whom I am pleased. But I believe he says that. We may not hear it. But I think when we are baptized, God says, that's the child of mine, whom I love, whom I am well pleased with. It pleases God. Because, it re you know what, it really doesn't matter what your, 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 your beliefs are, what the denomination is that you practice within. Because some, some, some will practice by, uh, uh, by, by, by sprinkling. And, and, and some will practice immersion. The ones who get it right practice. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Some, some will practice immersion. Some do it uh, as an infant. Some do it uh, later in life. But, but, but it, the symbol it represents is the same. We're saying this individual belongs to Jesus Christ. That's what baptism says. This person belongs to Jesus Christ. I want the world to know I belong to Jesus. And that pleases God. I don't think there's any question about it. And that frees us to be that voice that God calls us to be. God calls us to be a voice in the wilderness. As long as you're stuck, you cannot be that voice. But when you make it about Him, and that's what baptism is, it's about making it about Him, you are freed to be the one who goes out into the wilderness and calls others, goes ahead of Jesus and shares that message as John was. And the good news is that once you are baptized, you never get stuck again. Oh, wait a minute. That's not true, is it? We all know firsthand that we get stuck on occasion, don't we? Again. Stuck in a job, stuck in a relationship, stuck in a... Because our focus, you know why that happens? Because we know up here intuitively that it's all about him. But sometimes we get stuck out there and make it about other stuff. About the job, about the relationship, about the financial, whatever it is. So we get stuck again because we don't make it all about him. And that's where we enter into this season of Lent and we see a connectedness between even baptism and Lent. You see, the, the, those, the, those two topics, baptism and Lent, have been connected almost from the beginning of the practice of Lent. Almost from its conception. For in the year 325 A.D. at the uh, Council of Nicaea, they discussed for the first time 40 days of fasting. 
40 days of fasting, and it was specifically designated for those who would be baptized on Easter Sunday. There was a connection between Lent, the preparation for baptism, and baptism itself. It dated all the way back to 325. Now eventually, what happened? It Lent became something we all began to practice at some point in time. But initially, it was geared towards those preparing to be baptized on Easter, which is when almost all baptisms took place, by the way, in the early church, was on Easter Sunday, which I always think, how wonderful it would be if I had somebody want to be baptized on Easter Sunday. I think I had it happen once in about 15 years of ministry. But, but that's when people were baptized routinely in, in the church. And as I said, it expanded really to, to, to everybody in, in the Christian faith. Lent became a part of, of, of what is practiced, and fasting was a big part of that. So as we enter into Lent, we look at fasting as a part of it, as a means of allowing us to make it about Him. See, that's what Lent is about again. Much is baptism. It's about making it all about Him. Getting our eyes off of what's going on in the world and in our lives outside of, of our relationship with God and making it about Him. And so we fast. You, you know, uh, fasting was, was, was extremely uh, strict in its origins. Extremely strict. You know, they fasted for 40 days, as I said. 40 days of fasting. 40 days. And, and during that period of time, you could have one meal a day. One meal a day for 40 days. Think about that for a minute. That's fasting, right? Now, now, now let me add a little bit to that. You could have one meal a day. It had to take place after 3 p.m., okay? And you could have no meat. And you could have no fish. And you could have no animal product. All right? So, so I know what you're thinking. You think, well, well what's left? I, I guess maybe a little bit of bread. I, I don't know, and water. But, but that was fasting. And you say, why? why? Why fast? Why would anybody fast? Well, fasting was meant initially as a means of first disciplining yourself. Okay? You discipline. It, it is a discipline to fast. When your stomach starts growling, there's a discipline involved in that. And then the mindset is that that would help us discipline ourselves when Satan comes knocking. And when temptation comes out, we, we discipline our bodies to do what is right, to do what God would want us to do. So part of the initial practice of, 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 of fasting was disciplining ourselves. Part of it was sacrificing. You know? You do sacrifice when you fast, don't you? You sacrifice. And you even maybe suffer a little bit. I, I've told people, kind of, I used to fast a lot more than I do now. Uh, as I get older, I find it physically more challenging for me to do it. But when I fast now, almost invariably, I get these terrible cramps. I mean, just terrible cramps in my legs when I'm fasting. I, I wake up in the middle of the night and, I, and, and, and you know what though? I welcome that. Because when I start hurting and I feel those cramps, all of a sudden my mind shifts to, wow, how much more did my, my Savior suffer for me? I got these little cramps. It causes me to reflect upon how much he endured and, and suffered for me. I think about, about his suffering and, and, wow, a few cramps. What's that? I think about you know, what I'm sacrificing. I think, well, how much did he sacrifice? And I think that happens when you fast. I think it becomes natural. And I think that's why it's important that we make fasting a part of, of our preparation. Now, certainly it is also a time that's associated with prayer and other aspects. But fasting is, is, has always been a part. Always been a part of preparing preparing for the Easter celebration, preparing for baptism, preparing for a special ministry um, that you're being called to. It's always been a part of that. And it, it doesn't have to be fasting with one meal a day after 3 p.m. with no meat, no fish, and no, no uh, animal products. That's not what I'm saying. But it is a, a about sacrificing something. And so I would challenge you as you go through this time of Lent to, 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 to fast. Maybe, maybe it does mean that you're going to uh, periodically take a day where you just have a single meal of, of whatever nature. Maybe it, it means you will fast for a period of time, 24 hours, 40 hours, whatever the case might be. Maybe it means you'll give up something for the balance of life. You're just going to do without it. You see, because here's the thing. Believe it or not, while fasting is most closely associated with food, you can fast from anything. You can fast from TV. Now, there's a challenge for some of you. You know, for the next, the next 40 days, tell me, you're going to fast from TV. For some of you, that'd be a much greater sacrifice than not eating, I think. You know, or fast, you can fast from the internet, from Facebook, from whatever the case is. 
You can fast from anything. The key is that it'll be sacrificial. Now, I always tell people, when you're fasting, it's not just about what you're not doing, but it's about what you are doing. Not just about what you don't do, as in eat a meal. It's about what you do do. And, and some of you think, well, gee, if I fast from that meal, that would give me an extra half an hour to watch that TV that I wanted to watch. But, 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 but what I'm telling you here today is that make it something that you spend devoted to God during that time of fasting. You got an extra half an hour because you don't eat a meal? Read God's Word. Serve somebody in need. Take time praying. It's not just about what you don't do, it's about what you do do. I would challenge you, but this, this will help you greatly to get unstuck if you are stuck right now. See, that's what Lent allows us to do. Helps us to get unstuck. Clearly, fasting is also associated and connected with prayer. As you fast, you pray. I would challenge you to take time through the next 40 days as we prepare for the celebration of Easter to take more time praying. To take more time talking to God. Asking Him. You see, because self-evaluation is a big part of it too. Asking Him to reveal to you the things that you need to change in your life as you pray. Because we all are, 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 well, we all sin and fall short of the glory of God. There are things and changes we need to make in our lives. So as you go through this Lenten season, as you pray more, you say, God, just reveal to me where I need to change my life so that I might repent. I might turn away from those things and instead turn back to you with all my heart. That's what repentance is, turning back to God with all your heart. And, and, and so this can be a period of that renewal. This can be a period of, of becoming unstuck, uh, spending time going through this process, spending more time reading God's Word. We posted on our Facebook this week, we posted um, a reading plan that you can read that will take you through the four Gospels through the, the, the next six weeks. You're only down about ten chapters in Matthew right now. You can catch up almost tomorrow and be right on track. About two chapters a day, three chapters a day sometimes. Just things that you can do that say, this Lent, as I prepare for Easter, I want you to know, Jesus, it's all about you. That's what I'm telling you today. That's what I'm challenging you today. Make it all about Him. John gave us that message this morning. He gave us that message. I came to realize. You know, it, life can be challenging. Life can be a burden. Life can be extraordinarily difficult. But that burden is lifted, as John shared with us this morning, when we realize it's all about him. Always has been. Always will be. And so that's my challenge to you this morning. If you're stuck, if, even if you're not stuck, if you just want to be closer to your Savior, Jesus, than you've ever been before, make these next six weeks all about him. Be intentional. Plan it. Schedule it. And then do it and follow through. And I'm telling you, when Easter Sunday rolls around, you will be so close to your Savior. You will have a celebration like never before on Easter Sunday because you will not be stuck. And not only that, you will be that voice out in the desert going out ahead of Jesus and sharing with those the love of Jesus the message of God's grace, your Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, I thank you and, and, and praise you that you give us a chance to start over every day, to get unstuck every day. And then on top of that, you have these special times, whether it be baptism, where the Lord will we profess our faith and, and are freed from our sin and are used once again, or whether it be these periods of time like Advent and, and Lent where we refocus our attention on you and do the things that we probably ought to be doing well we just ought to be doing throughout the year Lord we pray that you would just help us to prioritize our lives this Lenten season to prioritize them in such a way that it truly is all about you not about what's going on at our workplace not about what's going on out in the world not about what's going on with our 401k plans, but about you. The burden will be lifted if we can do that, Lord. And so we pray that you would help us as we go through this season to do that, that we might once again be your voice calling in the wilderness to a lost, a lost world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.